Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at Airfix's 1 to 7 second scale Blackburn Buccaneer S2B. This one offers some Gulf War schemes, so let's see how we get on. Hope you enjoy. So as per usual, we're going to start with the cockpit, specifically the ejection seats. These are only made up of three pieces, two pieces for the frame and one piece for the centerpiece. That's going to be done twice before then moving on to adding a couple of elements to the actual cockpit tub. This includes putting the nose gear bay on the uh, underside of it and this back wall onto the back of it. This has to be at a very specific angle, otherwise it won't be able to fit into the later assemblies. I can then also make up the two control panels at this point in time, one for the uh, actual pilot and one for the navigator or weapons officer in the back. So as you can see, that piece just went flying into oblivion. I was lucky to actually find it, but it is one 70 second scale, so make sure you have your tweezers at hand. It is now time to put the first color down for the kit. This is going to be a medium C gray color for all of the cockpit. Uh, that includes the frames of the ejection seats, the general cockpit tub, and also the control panels. In regards to what I'm spraying at, I'm spraying at 30 PSI with a 0.2 millimeter needle. It's how I found the best results. However, I do recommend that you try around a bit beforehand. Once I'm happy that everything's been sprayed down, I can go on to a bit of brush painting. In regards to the seat, I'm going to just be using three tones of greens for the actual cushions or padding. And then I'm going to use uh, some blacks and also some buff paints just to pick out a couple of the elements and add some variation to it. When I'm brush painting, what I like to do is uh, usually dilute the paint a little bit more. I, even though I am here using some Ammo MIG, which is pre-thinned, I'll add a little bit more thinner just to make sure that I prevent as many brush strokes as I physically can. Although, do take that with a pinch of salt as my brush painting is definitely not perfect. Once I was happy that all the block colours had been put down, it was then time to move on to one of my first techniques that I'm going to use. It is dry brushing. Dry brushing is brilliant for highlighting all of those raised details which are sometimes lost with certain colours. Darker colours usually seem to mask details uh, more than light colours. So dry brushing is one of those really really simple techniques which can just help to bring a bit of a 3D element to it. I then thought that it was also good to do a tiny bit of sponge chipping. I didn't want to overdo the chipping and that would probably be a little bit unrealistic. However, a few scratches and chips would be welcome in my opinion. I'm doing that with pretty much just a sponge dipped in paint and then I'll dab it a lot off so there's hardly any paint on it and then I'll go in. So the last thing to do is then do some detail painting. Here you can see me using a buff sort of colour to highlight the um, seat belts that's on the top and also the bottom. Once I was happy with how the seats looked, I gave them a gloss coat, and this is VMS gloss varnish. I use it a lot in my builds, just because it's pretty thin, easy to use, and I quite like the gloss finish. This then gave me the base to do some uh, oil washes or pin washes. I use pin washes not really to create a grimy effect, but more to once again show the details and also give this idea of fake shadows. I'm really quite happy with how they turn out, um, as you know, it, it looks it looks a little bit more 3D, which is what I was going for. So I can then move on to putting a couple of the decals into the cockpit. The cockpit features no real raised detail, um, so you are given decals to put on instead. I'm not really opposed to this, however, if I can, if there is raised details, I prefer to paint it, but that's more of a personal preference. The decals all went on very nicely as they were Airfix decals, so you kind of know what you're getting. Once they were all in position, I then gave both the ejection seats and also the cockpit tub VMS's satin varnish as the glossy look didn't look incredible. When I was putting the second seat in, I did have a small accident. So this is just going to be a little bit of a reminder to everyone to uh, put the lids on your oil washes and stuff once you're done with using them because this made me a little frustrated. No, no, no. Fuck's sake. So with my minor meltdown out of the way, we could then continue to put the rest of the uh, ejection seats into the cockpit. They have a really nice system. The back one has a, a notch which goes into a groove and the forward one has a recess which slips into it. So I wanted to replicate a, a sort of screen glossy effect on one of the control panels and to do this all I did was get some gloss varnish and pretty much dab it over the screen. I did this in my recent F16 video and really liked the effect so I thought I'd do it again here. Are you going to notice it? No. Does it look quite cool? Yeah. So all of the oil effects, the pin wash, any of the fading was replicated on the inner walls of both sides of the fuselage 
uh, then I could uh, cement the cockpit assembly into one side of it. This went in quite nicely as there is a nice sort of recess and also a notch system so you're not really going to have any issues here. I did now have to cement the front control panel in. This was pretty darn fiddly as you can see however I did manage to get it in there in the end. Do make sure that you don't cement this in before otherwise you are definitely going to break it off when you're putting the two halves of the fuselage together. So it's a bit fiddly here but it's worth it. Another thing which I had to now think about doing was putting all the nose weight. Airfix recommends 15 grams. I just got a load of fishing lead BBs, uh, BB sort of weight things, and just smushed them in there. Uh, you can see one or two do fall out, but I was just going to be on the safe side rather than be sorry and have a tail sitter. The fit of these two pieces, even with God knows how many fishing weights in there, was still superb. So kudos to Airfix for presenting us with a really nice little kit here. So it was on to now drilling out a load of holes. Uh, I'm going to be doing pretty much this thing fully loaded out uh, with all different types of ordnance on there like targeting pods, uh, paveways and all that sort of stuff. So the instructions do tell you what holes to drill out in regards to what ordnance you are putting in there. Uh, they are different for each type of ordnance of course so pay very careful attention and just make sure you know what you're going to do in the future with it. I can now move on to building up the gear bay. So the gear bay on the Buccaneer also has the air intakes or the engines uh, kind of go through it, which is definitely quite unique about the aircraft. But because of this, there is definitely a lot more work in this gear bay compared to your usual sort of subject. Because of this, there are definitely quite a few pieces which make up the, the gear bay. That would usually, usually mean that you think there could be a couple of fit issues or a couple of problems in this area. However, it works really, really well. Everything almost slots and slides into place and you are left with a really convincing looking Buccaneer gear bay. Uh, that being said, do make sure that you get your colours correct as the uh, actual air intake pipes are, uh, or exhaust pipes I guess they are in this case. They are a gunmetal colour, not the grey colour. I know that is definitely uh, sort of something which you could easily make a mistake on. However, just pay attention on what Airfix tell you to paint it as and you'll be absolutely fine. There's this back bit which goes on and then that is pretty much your gear bay and your exhaust system all sorted. I can now move on to looking at the air intakes. So the air intakes are quite visible on the Buccaneer. Because of this, I thought I would spend a little time using a bit of uh, VMS super glue to clear up any seams which are in there. I don't think I did a perfect job here as it was quite a tight gap. However, I was happy enough with them. Once that was all sorted, I can then cement them onto the front piece which uh, holds the turbines for the engines. Once all of those pieces have been cemented in place and are secured, I can then bring in the top half of the fuselage and cement it on top. It's a really nice fit here, however that does not mean that there is not the need for a couple of clamps, just to make sure that you have a super tight fit and prevent anything you know, separating while the glue dries. I can then go on to cementing the top halves of the wing onto the uh, assembly. These went on really nicely. There's also quite a nice visible sort of uh, seam or step there which I think it looks quite realistic, it, you know, you can have your own opinion, however the Buccaneers do have the wing fold system and of course it isn't going to be completely flush, so having a small step just adds a little bit of realism to it. I can then go and work on the rear half of the fuselage, this is made up of two pieces and you have to make sure that you put this piece in there for the air brake as it almost acts as a little bit of a, a sort of a key mounting point for it, so definitely make sure that you have that in there. Once that's in there we can actually cement that assembly onto the rest of the fuselage and this has a really nice fit again, you know, there's a reasonable size seam which makes it look like a panel line and when you look on the real aircraft there is a panel line there so no need to make it all flush, which made me very very happy. I can now have a look at the exhaust cans, these have a nice little system in there where there's sort of a, a, a latch sort of system which ensures that you have the right spacing out the back. This part did have a small gap in it uh, between the rest of the fuselage, however this is sorted out using Vallejo's putty and then any lost details are then really really basically rescribed. Not a huge gap, it took me about 5 minutes to sort everything out so I'm not going to be doing any complaining here. So the plane looks a little bit funny without its front end so it is now time to cement that on. Once again quite a nice fit, it does flare out a little bit at the top however there is a bit of flex in it, at least mine had a little bit of flex in it so that was just pressed a little bit more into place so it didn't stick out just as much. 
I can then do some work on the horizontal stabilizer. It's one piece which I quite liked as that means that there's no need to clean up any seams on the leading edge which can, you know, it can always take away from the model a little bit. There's one or two other pieces, this sort of mini front nose cone, I don't know. But then it was on to look at the front pieces for the intakes, these went on really nicely as well. Uh, no proper gap between the actual sanded piece of the intake and the exterior piece, which I really liked. So I'm now at that point in the build where there's just a lot of pieces to go on, which aren't like major, major pieces. Uh, stuff like the, you know, the iconic sort of bulging Bombay and the actuators, I think these are called, and one or two of the sort of pitot tubes and that sort of stuff. So it's all really nicely done, this kit. It's probably one of my favorite airfix kits, which I've personally ever done. I think it was just an absolute joy to make this thing. And I, I really recommend this one, and I'm not being funny, but this is just one of those kits which you can get together really quite quickly. Like from start to finish, this took me four days uh, with all the painting, the weathering, the building. So it's one of those kits which you can kind of throw together, but you have a lot of fun while doing it. So if you can, definitely pick one up. Moving back onto the build, here you can see me putting on the uh, wing tips. Airfix seem to always do these as a, a sort of uh, a glass piece, not glass, but you know, the transparent glass piece. And I've never known why that is. So if you do know, please do tell me. I'd love to know why that is. Uh, a couple of other pieces, that being stuff like the, uh, you know, the refueling probe. I broke this thing off about 50 times during the build. So I'd recommend cementing it at the very, very end. Uh, definitely don't do it when I've done it because in the final photos you see there's a little bit of a bulge on it so try not to look at that but that's just why I keep on snapping it off uh, so the final sort of elements I have to go on before the priming is stuff like the blast shield the front canopy and um, the main canopy and then I'm pretty much ready to go on to priming so if you've watched my videos before you know that I usually like to use a black primer uh, that is because it gives me a good base to do any mottling and all, all the pre-shading and stuff like that However, today I'm going to actually use a different primer. I'm going to be using Mr. Hobby's uh, Mr. Surfer 1200, and it's a gray color. So the reason for me doing this and not sticking to my usual black is I wanted to really accentuate the panel lines on this one. As I recently looked at a Buccaneer in real life at RAF Hendon, brilliant museum if you've ever been there. And when looking at it and sort of having a look at all the colors, around the panel lines, it seemed to be much darker and I'm not exaggerating like much much darker than the the, the color around it so I thought mottling probably wouldn't convey this as much as I personally wanted it to so I thought using this technique would be a much better way of doing it before I actually did it um, I did do a little bit of research into the technique I specifically used a book which I recently got it's uh, pretty much ammo migs modeling encyclopedia and it's all about how to do the different paintings on it uh, and they recommended that sort of highlighting the the panel lines with the black would probably the best be the best way to convey this effect and I, I think I've got to agree uh, it didn't take as long as I usually take um, but that meant that I could go straight on to the uh, actual painting and for this I'm not using ammo mig I am in fact using extra color uh, Gulf War Desert Pink I believe that this color is probably the most accurate on the market at the moment purely because it's not too pink and it's not too brown. It's this really nice specific tone which when you look at images you think yeah that, that, looks, pre that looks pretty similar and pretty similar is good enough for me. I know it probably won't be for quite a lot of people however if I'm in the right sort of area when it comes to colors I'm more than happy. This goes on in quite a few uh, light coats being sprayed at 25 psi with a 0.2 millimeter needle. I definitely didn't want to over um, go, go too heavy on it to of course not drown out the pre-shade effect. Uh, once I was happy with the initial uniform coat I can then go back on top and really focus the, the color in a couple of areas where I wanted to dial back the effect even more. This just uh, makes it less uniform and more, you know, more interesting to the eye. Once I was happy that I had got quite a good base, I can then go on to fading a couple of the panels. And my personal way of doing this is go too much and then dial it back. It's a controversial way of doing it, but it's just how I prefer to do it. So I'll initially highlight a couple of the panels in a sand grau color. It's a German color. It's by Amomig, but any gray sort of color or a color which is quite a lot lighter than your base tone will always work. I will then spray it on. I don't want to go too hard on the color, just enough that you can see a noticeable difference. 
and then once I'm happy with the panels and where I've done it I will then get my extra color desert uh, pink again and then dial it all back down to however much I personally feel it needs. It's quite an interesting way of doing it. Uh, I know quite a few people like to just mask the actual panel off and then it's a really, really sharp variant. Um, however, I don't think that is incredibly natural. This is how I personally prefer to do it and I'm always quite happy with the results. So with general painting over, I can then go back to a couple of sub assemblies. Here you can see me starting to make up the air brake or the speed brake. Airfix allow you to either have it in the open or the closed position. I wanted to have it open. And there's a really, really nice sort of mechanism that everything kind of builds off of this main piece. And it worked, it worked brilliantly. You know, I had it built up in a matter of minutes and I, was, I really liked how it looked as well. Uh, once that was sorted, I can then get ready to actually put it onto the model. There's one or two other pieces which have to be into, like get on, put onto beforehand, otherwise it won't sit properly. This includes this sort of three, the sort of prong looking trident thing and also another bit, I know my technical language is horrendous, I do apologise. But once they are in position, I can then uh, use some VMS super glue and get the air brake into place really happy with how it looked i think it added another dimension to the model give it a bit more life uh, you know when you sometimes put flaps down uh, it makes it look a little bit more lively had the exact same effect here moving on to the gear now the gear have a really nice mechanism airfix's gears always like landing legs and gear are always brilliant they have a notch system which uh, gives you really really strong fit you're not going to have any of that wheel slippage which is you know, seen in quite a few other other model manufacturers. So with the actual uh, hub and the tire all glued in place, you can then cement the other half of the uh, landing gear leg on top and it slots into place really quite securely. And there you go, you have a nice chunky gear leg which is ready to support a lot of weight. Once all the gears were built up and cemented onto the model, it was then time for a gloss varnish. The gloss varnish is in preparation for all the decals and also the future weathering work which is going to go onto the model. The ordnance was also all um, glossed up at this time. Ordnance wasn't made up on camera purely because it was exactly like any other ordnance. It went together nicely. You know, it was that two-piece iconic bomb design and all that sort of stuff. So I thought I'll save a bit of time on the video and we can get straight onto putting the decals on. The decals are your usual airfix quality decals, you know, perfect thickness, not too thick, not too thin, just really, really enjoyable to put down. They also did have a little bit of saucy artwork on them, which made me chuckle when I was putting it down, as that was almost a staple of the Gulf War. You had some really interesting looking uh, nose arts and everything on there. It almost felt like World War II all over again. Um, but yeah, they all went down super well. They were super vibrant in the colors and they all conformed into the under line details with with relative ease actually I didn't have to use too much of ammo migs decal set and solvents to to get them to conform and yeah so definitely always a joy when you have stress-free related decals just gives you that extra boost going into all of the weathering so it was at this point which I thought it was a good idea to cement or in this case super glue or the ordnance that includes all the the pods the jammers the the bombs the fuel tanks all that sort of stuff so they all get cemented down oh, not cemented sorry super glue down using vms super glue uh they went down really nicely you know all of the holes were in the right place and they aligned nicely so i don't really have anything to report here and i really liked how it looked in the end it was then time to go over all of the decals with the gloss varnish just to protect them from all the weathering and the oil work which i'm about to do I recently went to a model show and also picked up some of these abtoiling oils because I've heard so much about them so I thought I'll get two oils just for this project and you know they're, they're oils which I'll use on quite a regular basis just to see how they are and I've really enjoyed using them. I mixed up the shadow brown into a, a pin wash and put that all over the model. This just helps to really bring out those details which were lost. Uh, in, in the painting process because it's quite a light color it's quite easy for those those panel lines to kind of fade away and you know a panel wash is needed to bring them back out and make them look really punchy any of the excess was cleaned up using a bit of white spirit and a flat headed uh, brush and I once that was done I thought I'll do a little bit more faded uh, faded panel effects but this time I'm using a different way of doing it I will pretty much just get some white oil paint brush it over the panel and then kind of use a bit of one of these sort of round head brushes to really blend everything back in really effective way of doing it and it really gives you um, 
much more pinpoint accuracy with it. You can also do a stress skin effect with this if you kind of dot it in in lines, um, the, the white oil paint in lines and then blend it in. I did that in one or two areas so you might be able to see that. Another thing which uh, had to be done was a couple of streaks and oils as these these things were dirty. They were dirty beds, I'll say that much. Um, so to do that it's your basic sort of put a dollop of oil paint, flat head, brush it back and then clean it up more into a uh, uh, a more stainy looking shape. A stainy looking shape is really just a really elongated uh, teardrop shape. And that was repeated all over the model until I was personally happy with how it looked. In some areas it was definitely dirtier than other areas, but this was just done off of looking at some reference images and what I thought looked best. Once that was done, I gave the entire model a satin varnish before then doing some of the final steps. The first one was doing the exhaust stains. The exhaust stains were done using Tamiya's weathering master pad. I've used this in many videos before and it just helps you get quite an authentic looking exhaust stain in my opinion. I then went on to peel off any of the masks and then fit the canopies on top. And that was this build finished. So I hope you've enjoyed this little build. I know I have. So enjoy the final photos and the final reveal and I'll see you again soon guys. Bye bye. Thank you.